The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Could everyone hear me? If you could hear me, please uh, click the raised hand button, and we will begin the webinar shortly. Okay, we will begin our webinar today. Hello everyone, my name is Tyler Kang and I'm a CA consultant from Midas and welcome to Insider's Perspective webinar. Today's webinar's topic is Tools for Efficient Modeling of Bridges with Unique Geometries by Zachary Taylor. To tell you a little bit about our speaker, Mr. Taylor is a bridge engineer from Michael Baker International, and he has finished his bachelor's degree in civil engineering at Utah State University in 2010, and also finished his master's in structural engineering at Utah State University in 2011. For his past significant projects, he has worked on Mexican hat steel arch feasibility study, I-215 reconstruction, for interchanges on Bangor Highway and Layton Crossing, which is a curved steel girder bridge. To all attendees, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to write them down in the question tab, and Mr. Taylor will answer those questions at the end. And now I will pass over the webinar to Mr. Taylor. Thank you. All right, can, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, if not, I guess someone can uh, let me know. Let's see. All right, well, thanks to everyone who turned, tuned in to, for today's webinar. Uh, like, like Tyler mentioned, uh, I'm Zach and I'm a bridge engineer with Michael Baker International. Uh, today I'm gonna show you one example of how the powerful tools within Midas Civil can be used to model bridges with unconventional geometries. Uh, when modeling structures with unusual geometry, finite element software like Midas becomes a very important, if not necessary, tool. Midas has developed several wizards to streamline the modeling process for a wide variety of complex structures, but occasionally we come across bridges that cannot be defined fully using one wizard or one tool alone. The purpose of this webinar is to show you one example of how the tools available in MIDAS can be used to help model complex bridges more efficiently. I will be focusing mainly on the development of our modeling approach and the MIDAS tools that we use to create our model. Without uh, some sort of approach or direction, complex models can become cumbersome and time consuming, uh, not just when creating the model, but also when trying to post process results. I hope that this presentation illustrates that to model quickly and accurately, you don't always need to have that perfectly tailored template or wizard or one size fits all type tool. Uh, Midas offers many versatile tools that can help you accomplish your project needs, whatever those may be. So that brings us to our project, um, Soaring Canyon Bridge. It's a, it's a driveway to a private re residence up in the mountains above Park City. Um, because when you have a house on the ridge line above Park City, I mean, why not, right? So here's our bridge uh, with a beautiful uh, sports car included. The, uh, the five span concrete box girder was designed as an architectural feature to the residents and the extreme geometry was needed to meet the county's requirements for uh, the driveway grade. So what we end up with is a five span curved concrete box girder with a couple of five, uh, 45 foot radius curves on a 10% grade with a somewhat unusual box girder cross section with uh, large tapered overhangs. 
So this uh, kind of shows the overall final geometry in a format we're a little more used to seeing as engineers. Uh, when I first looked at the concept plans from the architect, my first thought was, I'm going to need Midas. And my next immediate thought was, how long is this going to take? I, I didn't have a very good idea um, what direction to go to get this modeled uh, correct, correctly, accurately, and get the results that I was going to need. And just like any project, uh, any modeling project without an obvious solution, um, I, I realized I was going to need to come up with a direction first, some sort of approach. And for me, this was this was key. It saved me a lot of time. Um, I knew that I was if I hadn't spent a little bit of time up front planning it, planning everything out, um, figuring out what I needed, that I was going to have a lot of headache and uh, and time spent modeling later. So I realized that uh, this is just one example, and I don't really expect that many of you are gonna use this example as a template for your next curved concrete box skirt or bridge. Um, the tools you may use uh, might be different than the ones we use for this example, but the underlying concepts um, presented, I think can be applied pretty much any project. The first step for me was to determine uh, what, what were my modeling considerations. First and foremost, we needed the beam forces for uh, design of the concrete box girder. For this, pro uh, for this project in particular, we took the beam forces from Midas and uh, used those forces to design within spreadsheets. Uh, Midas does have design capabilities, but we will not be exploring those for, these web for this webinar. Uh, the second thing we needed the model for was for seismic response and design of earthquake resisting elements. Uh, we also had a custom design live load criteria since many of the trucks that we designed for on highway bridges can't even make it up the driveway because of the geometry. So we, we uh, came up with our own more appropriate live load uh, uh, criteria. The owner also had some concerns about potential maintenance of expansion joints. So the bridge was, it was decided the bridge would be modeled and designed as a rigid frame and temperature effects would need to be considered. I needed to also choose a method for creating the horizontal curvature and vertical profile since we wanted to account for the effects of the steep grade and varying column heights for the lateral and seismic analysis. Uh, for me, one of the most important things was I wanted to avoid a post-processing party, so I wanted to find an approach that would give me the results in a format that required as little manipulation as possible after the fact. Again, your project considerations may be different uh, from, this, from this one specifically, but identifying these things up front will help you to uh, find a direction before you start modeling. Once the modeling considerations were established, I needed to determine if there were any uh, design requirements that would also affect the model. And the two main references that we used for this were the ASHDO LRFD design code and the NCHRP report 12-71, which provides guidance on uh, the modeling and design of curved concrete box girder bridges. These two references provided guidance on when to use different model types for a curved concrete box girder. The, the methods addressed are plane frame, spine beam, and sophisticated 3D uh, analysis methods. Plane frame basically allows the bridge to be analyzed as if it were straight. A spine beam uh, allows for the bridge to be modeled as one beam that represents the entire cross section at the center line of the superstructure with corded beam elements around the curve. And then full 3D kind of can take a lot of different shapes, um, anywhere from a simple grillage model to an all plate model. Um, the central angle for this bridge ranges from 55 degrees to 68 degrees at uh, from support to support. So that puts us squarely in the, uh, the category of sophisticated 3D model, um, which rules out our simple plane frame and spine beam options. 
So of the many 3D options available, it's important to choose an option that's complex enough to get you accurate, accurate results, but not so complex that it becomes overcomplicated. Oftentimes, the more complex the model becomes, the longer the modeling process, and the more difficult post-processing becomes as well. The decision of what type of sophisticated 3D model to use is oftentimes going to be based on your own unique situation, um, engineering judgment. And um, for ours, we chose a grillage method using only beam elements since this, these types of models produce results in terms that are more commonly used in design by engineers and also um, based on uh, guidance from the NCHRP report, which uh, has which states uh, the reliability of these types of grillage models for concrete curved box girder bridges. Uh, the figure shown is a general representation of what a grillage model looks like if you're not already familiar with it. Um, basically longitudinal beams connected with transverse beam elements for distribution that are weightless but have stiffness. So the next step is to kind of dig into Midas a little bit. Um, now that we have established our design approach or our modeling approach, um, I wanted to experiment with what tools were available in Midas to quickly create my grillage model with all of the um, crazy geometry that I needed to, to get into the model. And so the first thing that came to mind for me uh, was actually to maybe I could import the geometry from CAD, which is an option uh, available in Midas. If you come up to the, I'll show you how to get to that. Come up to the Midas menu, import AutoCAD BXF file. Here using this, you can import uh, nodes and elements that you've drawn up in CAD program. Um, it's actually a pretty slick tool for complicated, especially for uh, effect, it's especially effective for uh, modeling tough geometry instead of maybe in place of a wizard. Um, I knew for me, this would take quite a while uh, due to my lack of 3D CAD skills. So I wanted to explore some other options and just see if there's anything else available. Um, so I went back into Midas and started exploring the, the wizard options. And the first one that caught my eye for obvious reasons was the grillage model. Um, I'm not gonna dig into this too much, uh, but I will show you a screenshot of what I was able to come up with using a grillage model. Um, and it's very rough uh, preliminary model. And this wizard may still be a good candidate for this type of structure, but for me, I found it uh, a little more complex than what I wanted to use. Uh, there's more beam elements than I wanted to have to process, and uh, I found it difficult to create a more simplified model that would fit, kind of fit our needs a little bit better. And so, decided against that. Um, I started looking at the PSC bridge wizard options, which was quickly ruled out for me because of uh, no option for creating a curve or a vertical profile. So I couldn't really, I, I was starting to feel like I couldn't find uh, a wizard or, or another tool that was gonna work very well for me. And was starting to feel like I would need to fall back on importing the geometry using CAD, which is, which is still a good method. I just knew it was gonna take me more time then it might take some someone who has a little bit better 3D CAD experience. So uh, one other thing that I knew uh, is that I, so I knew I needed a model with more than one girder line and that, um, and we felt like we could, we could probably model this structure using three or four main longitudinal girders is all we, we would need. And that kind of, got me thinking a little bit that maybe, well, the steel composite girder bridge wizard is one I'm familiar with and it does that, but it creates steel girders obviously instead of concrete. Um, but I thought, well, why can't we just use that wizard to create a framework and then swap our steel girders out for our concrete sections? And so, although we don't have, a comp uh, although we're not doing the steel bridge, 
we just need to establish a framework to build upon. And for me, uh, the steel composite was the fastest wizard or the fastest way for me to get to that framework. For you, it might be a completely different approach. Um, this is the one that we went with uh, for my purposes. So before we could use the wizard, there's still a little bit of prep work that I had to do. The first thing I needed to do was choose how I wanted to divide up the box girder for our longitudinal girder elements. And the two main central girders, this is how we divided it up, the two main central girders uh, used the webs of the box girder and half of the top and bottom slabs between them. And then that kind of was flanges and then the overhang divisions allowed us to capture what was happening. Um, the, the longitudinal response of the overhang areas out away from the center line of the bridge. The horizontal layout is created in the steel bridge wizard using beginning and end points and intermediate uh, PI points. So for our bridge, the first curve requires two PI points because of the length of the curve around. And the second curve is short enough that one PI was sufficient. For the vertical profile, the bridge is one constant slope between all of the supports, so the elevations were calculated at each support to be entered into the wizard later. In a grillage model, uh, transverse dummy beam elements provide the load path uh, for distribution between longitudinal girders. Um, these dummy elements provide stiffness, but they're weightless. The division of these transverse dummy elements that we used uh, follows the guidelines found in ASHDO and NCHRP report. The central angle from between the ends of any given longitudinal beam segment should not be greater than 3.5 degrees. And for our bridge, the maximum beam segment length was 26 inches. So it'll bring us back to the model. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the uh, step, all of the uh, tools in the wizard, and and the and all the tools we we go through step by step, just for lack of time. But there are many tutorials available, and the Midas Help manuals provide a lot of good detailed information about the tools we use in this webinar. So check those out if you aren't already familiar with them. I'm going to open up our wizard here that we used, and. So we're using the steel composite girder bridge wizard. So we have to select a steel composite eye section or a box or tub. We just went with the eye section. It doesn't really matter because we're going to change it. But uh, and span information was entered, deck width. We chose the all frame model, which is essentially just a grillage model. Um, main reason for that was we uh, we didn't want to deal with all the post-processing that comes with combining plates and beams in the system it get quite cumbersome and we uh we also wanted to be able to just pull beam forces out for uses uh, for use design use we selected the multi-curve option to lay out the horizontal and vertical control line as we showed in the other slide and this is what we ended up with so you can see our beginning point our intermediate points using the X and Y coordinates uh, that we calculated and the radius. Vertical curve was defined simply using stations along the curve, the horizontal curve and the elevations associated at each support. <clears throat> uh, we also chose to model with the substructure since we knew we'd be running a seismic analysis. And as part of this, we defined a bent cap, uh, columns with all uniform height, which we could have uh, I identified different column heights here if we wanted to in the advanced, but we just had them generated originally with the same height. And then uh, any support conditions that we wanted. Uh, in the section tab, this is where we defined our location of our horizontal uh, or our longitudinal girders. Um, the girder offsets from the center line 
were determined based on the centroid of each of the girder sections. That's what these numbers are. The transverse deck elements are the dummy beams, and the deck thickness is the depth of the transverse dummy beams between our members. This thickness uh, defined by the wizard will be modified after our framework is created to better represent the actual uh, transverse stiffness of the box girder. Uh, the transverse deck elements also basically define our length of the longitudinal beam segments or um, our mesh essentially if we want to call it that. The bracing section uh, is basically there to define any diaphragm or uh, intermediate and diaphragm conditions. Uh, information does need to be entered here for the wizard to run. So we put in some intermediate diaphragms and our bent and abutment diaphragms as well. Under the girder information, since we're using the steel composite wizard, we needed to use a steel composite eye girder as a placeholder. And the wizard won't recognize anything, um, any of our custom concrete shapes because uh, it's a steel girder bridge wizard. So uh, this is what we just kind of defined an arbitrary section. Doesn't really matter. Uh, we're going to end up changing it anyway, but that's what we used as a placeholder in order to generate the framework that we want. In the loads tab, um, I'm not going to cover a whole lot here. We just use this to generate some of our loads automatically for us, make life a little easier. Uh, you can also define traffic lanes here easily and any vehicles that you may use for your model. Construction staging can also be defined using the wizard. Um, in our case, we don't have construction staging, um, but this is a very handy tool if you're doing any kind of staging for construction. Run the wizard here. Get ourselves a nice, pretty helical curved bridge. So now that we've generated the model, first thing I did, uh, and actually I'm going to switch models here. Um, first thing I did was define some groups. Uh, groups are probably one of my favorite things in Midas. They make it so much easier to select and modify different areas of the model without having to select every element individually or accidentally selecting the wrong elements if you have that issue or um, it also makes it easier to isolate different portions of the bridge when viewing results. So you can just look at the girders or the columns alone and none of the other stuff gets in the way. Um, so I'll kind of actually cycle through some of these for you. Um, you can see that I can select the different girders or if I want to look at the dummy beams themselves or if I want to isolate a girder and set it as active, all these tools are, are very helpful in the modeling process. <clears throat> so before we ran our wizard, we defined our girder shapes that we wanted to substitute in for our placeholder steel girders. Um, these, these can be defined either using, uh, let's see here, we yeah, have section properties where I can either add um, you know, there's a myriad of different shapes that you can you can define there. But for me, it was actually easier to use the general section designer to create our little custom shapes. I'll just kind of show you a couple examples of those shapes. So here's one of our interior box beams, and then. This is one of our overhang beams. Uh, these are just defined. You can define the materials, uh, the coordinates as well. It's a pretty slick little tool to make whatever shape you, you end up needing for any kind of girder. And then these can be imported back into Midas using uh, by converting them to a, an SEC file, which we did for all four. So using those new girder shapes, 
um, we can substitute out our steel girders um, for our new concrete girders. Um, oh, by the way, um, in case anybody's curious, the tree menus, um, I, I like to have two tree menus open. If you're interested in how to get there, if you right click in this space up here, you can get a second tree menu. It tends to be kind of handy when you're working between the different dialog boxes. So if we want to swap out one of our girders, say the inside overhang girder, uh, all we have to do is select it and then assign a new girder. I will just check to make sure we did this right. And looks like we got it modeled in there correctly. So now no more steel girder, new concrete girder. Uh, same process for all four girders, swap them all out, and we've got ourselves a uh, concrete bridge instead of a steel bridge. Uh, the next thing that we needed to do is define our transverse dummy beams. So currently they're all represented, and actually I'll show those to you now. just as rectangular, eight inch thick uh, beams. As you can see from the way that this looks here, there's a lot of overlap on the inside curve uh, and there's some gaps on the outside. Uh, we wanted to account for that and get the stiffness right, make sure that we were, we were accounting for our transverse uh, stiffness the right way due to the curvature of the bridge. So we tapered these sections. Um, and so we assigned, we defined new sections for each of the um, overhang uh, dummy beams, as well as the, the central beams that connect the two uh, box girder, like between the webs. And so in order to swap these out, you just follow the exact same process. Um, well, first off, you know, I'll, I'll show you uh, how you can define a tapered section here from scratch if you were to try and do this. Um, we use a solid rectangle. So you have two axes of uh, variation and you just define them simply in these, uh, these little boxes here and you got yourself two tapers and a vertical and a, and a horizontal taper. And that's what we did for these. So let me show you that. Selected just this outside curve here. And assign the tapered sections. Um, what, what I didn't show you actually, I'm gonna delete this just so you can see what, what happens. But if you don't have a tapered group assigned, it will just assign each of those. I, I'm sure you can see this, but uh, it'll just assign each of those beams as the tapered section definition that we defined, which is not really what we want. We want them to taper as a group. So in order to do that, you select those beams, come to properties, tapered groups, assign a name, I'm just gonna call it group one, and then hit add and now you've got a nice tapered overhang section and horizontal, horizontally as well. So we followed the same process again for all of the uh, tapered overhangs and also for the central uh, dummy beams between the, uh, the box girder webs. Uh, one thing to note about that is, um, I'm actually gonna switch over. We had to do some modifications to both the longitudinal there we go. We had to do some modifications to the longitudinal elements to get them to behave properly for the modeling process. Also, the, tra uh, the transverse dummy beams. So this is an excerpt from the uh, NCHRP report, and it outlines how the property should be modified to create the proper model response. So essentially, you know, for instance, we have two uh, channel shapes but really it's one box girder and the uh, torsional stiffness of a, a channel shape is, 
is so much different than a closed uh, box girder. And so we need to make some modifications to some of the uh, properties to get it to behave more like an actual box. Um, since the sections are defined as a value type, we can easily modify each of the properties based on the recommendations in the NCHRP report. For transverse dummy elements between girder webs, the dummy elements were modified according to the guidelines in the report as well. These guidelines are uh, modify the section properties to convert the two slabs, top and bottom slabs, into one equivalent beam member. In Midas, uh, this was also defined as a value tab, so it's very easy to get in and just modify whatever properties that you need um, to tweak to get the model to behave as, as desired. Unfortunately, uh, sections defined in the value tab can't be tapered, so our central box girder elements were not able to be tapered. Um, I'm gonna switch back to the model and just show you how those can be modified. For instance, just use this overhang beam. So we imported, oh, actually, let me show you how I imported those longitudinal beam members. Never did that. So if you come to the value tab, go down to general section, you can import those SEC files that we defined earlier for our beams. For instance, let's say we want to do the overhang beam. And there you go. It brings it in with all of the section properties. And now those section property properties can just be modified by hand as needed to get them to behave the way you want. Same thing goes for the transverse beams. Uh, the transverse dummy beams. So I'm going to look at the ones between the webs. So kind of like I described, it's one rectangular section for um, basically two, well, a top and a bottom slab, but we modified the properties. We calcu first calculated the section properties for the rectangle and then modified the appropriate uh, properties to get it to behave more like it should. So for lack of time, uh, I can't show you all the modifications that we made to the model after this. Those are the, the main, um, the bulk of the changes that we made to get it to where we needed it to be. But I'll kind of describe some of the other changes we made um, just briefly. So um, we had, when we the wizard generated the model, we got some extra vent cap uh, nodes that we didn't need. So these were removed, deleted. Also, our columns were extended up to frame into our, our uh, diaphragms up here above the columns. Um, they're right now co connected by uh, an elastic link, which we also removed because it wasn't applicable for our bridge. And then uh, the columns themselves were also lengthened to their appropriate lengths and intermediate diaphragms that were defined were removed since they were shown not to prove or provide significant contribution to this bridge um, since the top and slab top and bottom slabs provide a significant amount of stiffness between the box girder webs uh, i'm going to switch to our final model here we also added some abutments as thick plate elements. And then you know, the last thing we did was verify boundary conditions and adjust boundary conditions to what they needed to be for our specific model. Um, for, for other models, maybe not this one in particular, um, part of that process would involve uh, going through and checking rigid links, elastic links, wherever applicable, making sure that they're all in the right places. Um, since we have the rigid frame, there's very few of these types of conditions to, uh, to modify. The next thing we did was to define all of our loads, external loads, including temperature, uh, some external decorative fun stuff, uh, centrifugal force, braking force, all of our wind loading, 
lateral earth pressure behind the abutments, live load surcharge behind the abutments, self weight of the members, uh, some uh, barrier weights or curb and railing weights, as well as, well as wearing surface. All of these load cases were combined into different load combinations and then enveloped as needed. We also defined our response spectrum for seismic and all and our seismic load cases. We defined all of our lane locations, different combinations of vehicles in our load cases as well. And as part of those, we, we also had to define our control data for the uh, seismic analysis and for the moving load analysis. I'm not going to show you uh, any of that in detail for lack of time again, but um, one thing to note in all of this is that as you go along, um, you should always perform intermediate gut checks to verify and validate your model as you move from one step to the next. You don't want to get all the way through your process and find that you need to go back and fix something that's going to take you away from, or that might take you all the way back to the wizard step per, per se, and you've lost all the work you've done um, after you've generated your model through the wizard. And um, let me show you some of the results that we got here. Actually, I'm going to So you can see how a model like this is very easy to post-process after, after you've done the modeling. Um, one thing that's interesting about this is we were able to see how, how little the actu actually the uh, overhang beams contributed to, the, to resisting the, the moments. There is some contribution, but the majority of it's taken up by that interior box beam. You can also look at torsional forces which you'd expect to see for a curved bridge like this. Also, uh, we can isolate the columns here and look at some of the seismic forces that were in our columns. So overall, um, pulling forces out of a model like this is quite a lot easier than trying to uh, figure out how to reconcile forces in a combined plate beam model and some of that other. Uh, although it's not necessarily a bad uh, method for modeling, it just involves a lot more post-processing. So um, that's basically the bulk of what I wanted to show you. Um, we've been able to successfully use similar process to this for multiple uh, different complex bridge structures. And using these combinations of tools like this, uh, we're able to, to expedite the modeling process quite a bit and make it a lot, uh, a lot easier on our budgets and, and schedules as well. So with that, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Okay, so now I will be showing the questions to you. Give me one second. Okay. So here are the questions, and yeah, so please proceed. Okay, so the first question is, you said you used your own loading. Uh, how did you come up with that loading, and is it more conservative than ASHTO requirements? Um, I would say, well, so first off, we, we used a lot of ASHTO. We, we used the MBE, actually, for a lot of our loading. Uh, we, we selected vehicles from the load rating side of things that tended to fit with more with what could actually go up the driveway. Um, so we chose we chose vehicles that would would actually fit, and then ran those as the live load. We also modified the uh, the factors. It was in a lot of cases it was a lot less conservative than Ashto, just because with that Ashto you're you're dealing with you know 
large trucks on a freeway constantly hitting bridges hard and and this is an isolated location that hardly sees any heavy traffic it's mostly just um you know suvs or whatever so uh but we did want to make sure that it could accommodate you know uh moving trucks and and that type of thing construction equipment so hopefully that answers that question uh, the next one is how is the braking load and centrifugal load from traffic considered in the model um, we hand calculated the centrifugal uh, the centrifugal and the braking load and applied it in a way that would kind of produce worst case results so for braking load for instance um, you, you notice on the shape of the bridge there was kind of a straight section um, we applied in our load combinations, we applied the braking load all in the same direction, um, assuming that the entire bridge would kind of contribute in resisting the braking load. And centrifugal load, uh, we applied individually to each column to find the worst case scenario. So there was a little bit of post-processing there and some uh, back and forth that we had to do to figure out what was the worst case. It was just applied as a point load at the top of the column and also a corresponding moment at the top of the column for uh, for the eccentricity required for centrifugal. Uh, next question says, can Midas also import Bentley's microstation designs and models? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. I have several colleagues who have shown us how, showed us how to do this. Um, I personally haven't used it, but it looks like a very, very slick tool for importing geometry. And I'm hoping that at some point I'll get the opportunity to get a little better at that. Um, I'd like to see how, how that can work in an actual project. But yes, you can do that. It must be in a DXF format though, I believe. Uh, let's see, next question is, how, how come you didn't create one line and apply cross section uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding. It. How come? How come you didn't create one line and apply uh, cross section to the whole? Oh, okay. So I kind of explained this a little bit earlier. Um, so the NCHRP report allows you to do this for curves that have a small enough central angle, but if the central angle gets too big. Um, it's not adequate to just run it as one line. Um, there needs to be multiple beams applied. So one thing that might be interesting for some reason, we did look at, um, we compared the results that we got from our four beam analysis to a three beam analysis where we did the box itself as one beam and then the overhangs kind of the separate beams. And we did come up with pretty similar results. It was you know, either one probably would have been fine for our purposes. And then the last question here says, start to finish, how long hours, days did it take you to develop your model process and post-process it? Well, that's, that's a loaded question for sure. Um, I would say that for modeling and coming up with a model and a process, uh, it was kind of a little bit back and forth trying to figure things out, but overall modeling time, I would say two or three days tops. Um, and then develop, I, I'd probably say a week of, of total time. Um, if you all added it up back to back. Um, so it wasn't too bad. Um, probably saved a lot of time in sitting there trying to move, you know, nodes and things. Uh, uh, vertically to get my elevations right in 3D, and I, I'm not super skilled with that. So anyway, it, I think it saved me some time for sure. Uh, post processing, that became, I mean, that in and of itself, probably a, you know, the week's worth of work trying to compile all the forces into what they needed to be, combine them as needed, to uh, put them into my actual design through the spreadsheets. Any other questions? 
Okay, actually, Mr. Taylor, we're answering those questions. We have got more questions. Questions? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll just read that out to you real quick. Since we have, some, we have 15 more minutes, maybe, then there's a few more questions for us. All right. Okay, so the next question is, um, how did you control or enter the transverse stiffness between the box girder pieces? Oh, okay. So I wish I could show you, um, but in the Midas model, uh, there are, well, so for your sections, you have, if you define your dummy beam per se, that between the girders, if you define that as a value type, then you can manipulate uh, any of the properties that you want, really. Uh, and that's basically what we did is, you know, gave ourselves the option to change the properties as needed. I'm, I hope I answer, I'm answering that question right. Um, but that's that's essentially how we, we handled that. And those were based off of the NCHRP report. Okay, the next question is, uh, can you please explain how you model the torsional box stiffness? Oh, sure. So for the longitudinal beams, uh, the NCHRP report covers this as well, but essentially what we did is take the entire box section torsional stiffness and divide it by the number of webs in the box. So you're getting essentially what you would get. It's just half and half um, for the longitudinal girders. And, and we verified that with a single box girder element just to see how they compared and it was quite similar. Um, transverse there were some other equations involved um, you'd have to probably get into the report a little bit to to fully uh, see or for, for me to it would be tough for me to explain without getting into the report but if you were interested to know you could get into that report and see how the top and bottom slabs were accounted for and how their moments of inertia were modified and kind of come up with that Okay, um, we actually have a bunch more questions, but I'll just select um, two more and then we will end the session for today. Um, okay. Okay. If all play model you were used, how how do you use Midas to design the box girder mesh meshed by the plate element? That is a good question. That's one that we thought a lot about. Uh, we, we thought about actually doing an all plate model um, but we, we also struggled with trying to figure out how we would design using that. Um, I know, I'm sure there's a way we could have done it. We just realized that it was going to take us longer than we wanted to. And we, we were able to get pretty, uh, pretty good results out of what we did model. And so we didn't go that route. Um, but I would also be interested to know how that would go. I think that would take quite a while. Okay, the next one is, um, you mentioned that you computed the elevations at each support, support outside of MIDAS. How did you import those elevations into the model? Okay, so uh, we, we calculated those and then in the, uh, what's the name of it? Uh, the, forget the name, it's, uh, it's the advanced button for the multi-curve, that's what it is. Inside the wizard, there's a little section at the bottom. It's just a hand input. So you had to, we had to calculate how far along the center line the support was for a, a station input, and then we just had to enter in the elevation just by hand in the box in the wizard. Okay, actually, there's uh, one more question. There's two questions that's similar, so I would like to go over. Um, so, okay. Okay, so the last question is, uh, what type of foundations did this bridge have, and uh, what about the soil interaction and the foundation? There, there's two different questions, but yeah, similar question. Sure. Uh, good question. Um, the they were spread footings for the location. Um, actually, it was pretty good soil uh, up up on the mountain. It, there's a lot of bedrock up there, so everything was on soil foundations or spread footing foundations. 
and uh, the soil interaction, we just, we took, so we used the, uh, the forces that were developed, we assumed a fixed condition. Um, and then we considered, you know, the effects of overturning and, and those types of things based on uh, the forces we pulled out of the model. So we didn't do the actual soil interaction inside Midas, um, but we did it like you would do, you know, for a, a, a typical spread footing outside of Midas. Okay, so yeah, thank you for answering all these questions. Uh, I know there are um, more questions in the question box, but uh, please, if you're still uh, curious and would like to get the answer for it, please uh, reach back out to us and we will give you the answer. And uh, Mr. Taylor, thank you very much for your presentation. It was wonderful. You bet. All right, thank you everyone for attending the webinar and this will be the end of it. Thank you.